Welcome to this video. Today I will be explaining the well known and probably the best pathfinding algorithm so far developed, the A star algorithm. This algorithm finds the optimal path between two points. When I mean optimal, I mean the shortest path. Additionally, it also includes the ability to avoid obstacles. Today I will be showing a pseudocode of the algorithm in case you want to implement the algorithm in your code yourself. In case you don't know what a pseudocode is, it is basically a simplified universal language which coders and people can understand. It's not a programming language which actually does things. In the next video, I will of course be taking one step ahead and showing how the algorithm is done in JavaScript. Anyways, let's start. So to start off with, imagine you have a map of a small town and you want to get from your destination, the starting point, to a certain place, the ending point. Now, there are many ways of doing this, but the A-star algorithm divides the map into shapes. In my example, I will be using squares. These squares are called nodes. A node is a fancy name in computer science, which basically means something that is connected to a network of other things. In this case, each of these nodes in the map are connected to all the other nodes in the map. The more nodes you have in the map, obviously, the more accurate the shortest path will be as you're going more and more precise. For the sake of simplicity, let's use a map with 20 columns and 15 rows. The white nodes represent the places where you can go, the black nodes represent the obstacles, or in this example's case, the houses. Now the main feature of the A-star algorithm is keeping track of how far a node has traveled from the start, how far it is from the end, and the sum of both. These are known as the g-cost, the h-cost, and the f-cost respectively. On calculating how far the node is from the end, for example, the distance to nodes on the sides is always 1, and the distance to nodes on the corners is always the square root of 2. This is simply found from trigonometry. So the h-cost is always constant because the distance to the end never changes. Well, in our case. The g-cost, however, can change. You may think that it is simply the distance from the start to the node, but not exactly. The g-cost is the distance that the current path has traveled from the start to get to its location or to get to its node. So here you can see how the g-cost can vary even though we're going from the starting point to the same point. Clearly, root 2 is the better option because it covers less distance. Since g-cost can change, the f-cost can change too, as it depends on the g-cost. So coming back to the small town example, let's see how the A-star algorithm actually works using this logic. If you noticed, I changed the town just to keep the example a bit simpler, so now it's just two narrow buildings in the middle. As we go through this example, you will be able to see the f-cost of each node. The f-cost is actually a long decimal due to the h-cost, but for the sake of simplicity, I have rounded the values to one decimal place. So the algorithm starts off with the first node, the starting node. This node has 8 neighbors. The next step is to calculate the f, g, and h-cost for those neighbors. Notice how the neighbors are now green. This is because they have not been visited yet. They have only been discovered. These are called open nodes. The starting node is a closed node because it has been visited. It should appear red, but because it is a starting node and so we can differentiate each node properly, it should have a different color. After calculating the F and G and H costs of all of these nodes, which have been discovered but not visited, the open nodes, the next step is to evaluate which of these nodes have the lowest F cost, the lowest total cost. Clearly, it is this one. So now the algorithm goes to the node with the lowest f cost and sets it to visited. From here, it is almost repeating. Once again, the algorithm finds all the neighbors of this newly visited node which have not been visited yet, the green neighbors. Now it will calculate the f, g, and h costs of all of its neighbors. Notice that not all of the neighbors have updated their f, g, and h costs. This is because it is clearly easier and faster to go from the start directly to this node than to go from the side. The, the overlapping neighbors will only update if it is indeed a better path. Again, the algorithm searches through the open nodes, the green ones, and finds the node with the lowest f cost. Here it is this one, so it will set this to visited and it will turn red. Again, it will find all of its neighbors, which have not been visited yet, and calculate their f, g, and h costs. Now, this is basically happening over and over again until it has found a node, which is the ending node. I think it will be easier if I also explain this algorithm with the use of pseudocodes and also showing from which way the nodes came from. The way that they came from is their parent node. This will be further clarified in this example. So here I have hidden the f costs. Instead, I'm showing these arrows which indicate the direction from which the node came from. Having the concept of a parent node is really useful as it allows us to calculate the g cost, 
the distance traveled from the start node really easily. We can see how much the current node's parent has traveled from the start and then simply add 1 or square root 2 to get to the current node. Anyways, let's rewind a bit and start from scratch. We start off with a list of open nodes, the green nodes, as well as a list of closed nodes, the red nodes. This is useful later to keep track of which nodes to use in the algorithm. Next, we add the starting node to the list of opened nodes. This is because we have discovered the starting position, but still not visited it. So now we have one open node, which is a starting node. We can now run through all the open nodes and find which one has the lowest f cost. Once we find it, we can set it equal to a variable called current node. Hmm, but there is only one open node, so we are 100% sure that the starting node will be selected. So now we have a current node variable, a node that we have visited. So let's go ahead and remove this current node from the open nodes list and add it to the closed nodes list. This is simply because we have not only discovered it now, but we have visited it. Remember, the open nodes list only contains nodes which have only been discovered and not visited. Now we go through each of the current node's neighbors which have not been visited yet. In this case, all of them haven't been visited yet. So how do we write this in pseudocode? Well, at first, we can loop through all of the neighbors of the current node. Then we can skip the neighbor if it is an obstacle or if it is a neighbor which has been visited. Remember, we only want the neighbors which have not been visited yet. The green ones, not the red ones. To do this, we can check if the neighbors is in the closed list. Now we have to add all those new neighbors to the open list. This is because we have discovered them but not visited them. We can simply write if the neighboring node has not been discovered yet, which means it is not in the open list. Now this neighbor node would be initially white because we hadn't visited it or discovered it before. So if this condition is true, we have discovered a new node. So we set this new discovered node's parent as the current node because it is coming from the current node. Then we update the neighbor's g cost by finding the g cost of its parent and adding 1 or square root 2 depending on its relative location to its parent. Now that we've updated the g cost, we can also update the f cost because it depends on the g cost. At the end, we have to add this node to the list of open nodes because it is a discovered node, a green node. What if the neighbor is an opened node, a green node? For this, we have to remember that example where some of the open neighboring nodes were not updated because they will result in a worse path. Well, that bit comes here. Now we can check if the f cost, the total f cost of the neighbor is less or more than the f cost of the neighbor if we attach it to the current node. So if the new f cost calculated by the current node is lower than the neighbor's original f cost, that will mean that making a path through the current node and to the neighboring node um, would be a better path. So like I said before, we can find the g cost of a current node by finding the sum of the g cost of its parent and adding 1 or square root 2. So because this will be a better path, we can firstly set the parent node of this neighbor as a current node, indicating that the neighbor is coming from this current node. Then we can change the neighbor's g cost to its parent's g cost plus 1 or square root 2, again depending on its relative location to its parent node. Now that we've changed the g cost, we must update the f cost of that neighbor. Remember that the h cost of all the nodes are constant throughout the simulation as the distance to the end node does not change, ever. This will only run this a star algorithm once, so it will only calculate everything for the first iteration, the first node. So we must loop through this. In this way, the current node will change every iteration and this will find the optimal path from the starting node to the ending node. Let's see how this goes. Well, it clearly looks like we've missed something. We haven't told the program to stop searching. So we can add this bit of code, which basically checks if the current node is equal to the ending node, which basically indicates that the destination has been reached. All right, great, it works. But where's the path? This is the part where a few people struggle with, so I just thought I'd mention it. The optimal path is done through backtracking. Remember the use of the arrows? We can see which node another node comes from or in other words, which node is a parent of another node. We can start from the ending node and trace the direction of the arrows until we get to the starting node. Done. No, this has to be done by the computer, not by us. At the if statement, which checks for the ending node, we can add a bit of code which firstly creates a path list. This will include a series of nodes kept in order which makes up the path. 
This is simply done by creating an additional variable which keeps track of the current node and the path. The first node in the path will be the ending node, which is always the current node in the last execution of the program. So let's add this to the path. A conditional loop can be placed just under. The condition can be keep iterating until you reach a node without a parent. That seems to be the starting node, right? While the condition checks for this, we can add the current node in the path to the path list and then make the current node in the path equal to its parent. Then we can use a simple graphics technique to loop through all of those path elements or nodes and create a basic path through which the path goes through the X and Y positions of all the nodes in the path list. In this way, the short path making algorithm will lead a path from the end to the start. Now it looks like we're done. In some of the future videos, I will be taking a look at this algorithm again, but in JavaScript. That will be the fun part. So go check that out if you haven't already. And thanks for watching.